you all for being here. I think most people are on the way to leaving. <laughs> so even if we have a couple of people who are interested, it's nice. I'm Dr. Chintan Malhotra from uh, PGI Chandigarh. I have with me Dr. Rahul Bhapna, who's uh, faculty here. And I think without corneal ectasia is something which is, uh, uh, can we have the, uh, can I request the support team to give us the program for the, uh, this session? And ectasia is something which we are dealing with on an everyday basis. And uh, so sometimes the cases, there's a crossover. One doesn't know what to treat, when to treat. And some of those issues are being addressed uh, in this session. Uh, so I will uh, request uh, Dr. Pankaj Dongre to start right away with association of keratoconus with lid abnormalities. Dr. Pankaj Dongre, please. Hello. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So. Uh, Top, uh, the topic uh, is association of keratoconus with eyelid abnormalities. So uh, I will be discussing this topic with a case. So this was a 17 year old male who presented to us with watering and photophobia in both the eyes. And also there was diminution of vision in both the eyes since many years. And uh, there was history of uh, some kind of lid surgery uh, which was done, the details of which were not available few years ago. So this was the uh, clinical photograph during presentation. We can see uh, <coughs> there is shortening of the palpebral fissure height and inward turning of the uh, eyelashes. So his visual acuity in the right eye was counting fingers 1 meter uh, and in the left eye it was 20-40. Uh, the eyelids uh, ha has a distortion and scarring at the lid margin and they were uh, interned. Uh, in the cornea of the right eye, there was a full thickness scar with desmet membrane tear, whereas the left eye cornea was clear. Yeah, as, as we can see in the clinical uh, picture, there was uh, inward turning of the eyelashes and the scar in the right cornea. So uh, the electrolysis was performed in this patient, uh, which uh, gave uh, relief of the symptoms and after that the corneal topography was planned. So in the corneal topography, as we can see in the right eye, uh, due to the presence of scar, there was uh, irregular topography, uh, whereas the left eye shown uh, the features of keratoconus where we can see the inferior superior asymmetry along uh, uh, there was thinning in the pachymetry map. <coughs> the ASOCT in the right eye shows the hyperreflectivity in the center cornea with retracted desmet membrane tear. So the uh, patient was advised uh, for the scleral contact lens to know the visual potential of the patient. Uh, after the scleral contact lens, his best corrected visual acuity improved to 2040 in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye. Uh, along with this patient, uh, his younger sibling, the 14 year old female also visited to us during the same day with same complaints and she also has history of electrolysis in both the eyes uh, done for intern lashes. This was her clinical picture. Uh, again, the uh, in both the eyes, the eyelashes were uh, turned inside. There was congestion on the conjunctiva in the right eye along with epithelial defect. The anterior chamber was quiet. <coughs> this was the clinical picture, which again shows uh, this. Uh, we can see the epithelial defect with inward turning of the eyelashes. Again for her we have the same plan, uh, electrolysis in both the eyes along with application of BCL and in the and the corneal topography in the later period. Her corneal topography also showed uh, the signs of keratoconus uh, in both the eyes, uh, right eye as well as the left eye. <coughs> so the lid abnormalities and keratoconus what happens is like whether the patient has VKC or any other eyelid. Uh, pathology the patient keeps on rubbing the eyes which triggers the uh, 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 which releases the uh, uh, interleukins and many inflammatory cells thereby incre thereby further increasing the uh, eye rubbing so uh, VKC and keratoconus the association is very well known uh, the prevalence of keratoconus is very high in patients with VKC and also the keratoconus is more severe in these patients also, keratoconus has been reported with floppy eyelid syndrome. Uh, patients with floppy eyelid syndrome, they uh, might have chronic papillary conjunctivitis, which can cause excessive eye rubbing leading to keratoconus. Also, in patients with blepharitis, uh, the keratoconus has also seen again because of eye rubbing. 
uh, so the learning points from these ca- from these two cases is like the imp- it is important to identify the risk factor that could predispose to keratoconus the association of keratoconus with uh, dystichiasis has not been reported so this was the uh, first case which has been reported the early management of the risk factors and screening for keratoconus is uh, is very uh, beneficial and the treatment should include correcting the triggering factor uh, which is causing ocular irritation and eye rubbing thank you Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. I think you've highlighted a very, very important topic and an often overlooked finding. You know, uh, when we see have a residents, you they are focusing right on the cornea, ye finding hai, wo finding hai, but they often miss looking at the upper lids. And I tell them that if you're not looking at the upper lids, you're not averting the upper lids, you're not seeing the contour of the upper lids, then you're never going to be able to treat this patient well because you're never addressing the basic cause, Correct. right? And floppy eyelid syndrome, again, is another often overlooked entity. We don't pay attention to it. And that's something which leads to chronic irritation and which uh, has that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Pankaj. Did you do epithelial mapping for this patient? Uh, no, epithelial mapping was not done. So when the patient presented to us initially, they were very symptomatic because of the uh, surface irritation. No, sometimes, see, epithelium is the most dynamic structure we yeah. know. So anything irritates the epithelium, change the epithelium thickness. Correct. Sometimes that might be leading to the fallacious finding. I uh, know what the the first patient, the, the uh, he had already the corneal scar corneal in the scar, right okay. eye, which uh, was indicative of he had uh, high drops previously. Okay. Thank you. It's a very good presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very nicely highlighted, uh, Dr. Pankaj. I think uh, the point that you have noted is uh, to always look for a cause, biomechanical cause. And we do find uh, in the, even in the absence of allergy or any lid abnormality, patients who are habitual eye rubbers and the patients themselves don't realize it. So when we ask the question, we generally ask it in front of the family. So many a times the family themselves say that, yes, he keeps rubbing his eyes yes, and very vigorously, which the patient very vigorously denies as well. Yeah. So it's a very nice point that you have highlighted and thank you. Thank you. Sometimes patients will not give a history of uh, itching, but you avert their lids, and Correct. you will see some papillae, and so you know that there is some allergy. So I would always uh, rather over-treat the allergy in these patients rather than under-treat it, even if the patient is not reporting symptoms of uh, Correct. Correct. itching. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so do we have the next speaker with us, Dr. Shilpa Tarani? Uh, Dr. Gedela Divya? Uh, Dr. Somya Peri, I think, has gone for another session. And then so I'd like to invite Dr. Charuta. I think Charuta, you'll be next. She'll be speaking about progressive endothelial cell loss in keratoconus post-CXL, um, endemic, epidemic, or neither of the above. Again, a very, very important issue, I think, and something we need to be careful about. So how many in the hall are uh, routinely doing cross-linking? I mean, we have a few people. Because you know, cross-linking is something which is uh, uh, done not only by the cornea specialist, it's done by the ocular of comprehensive ophthalmologists as well. Uh, and it's important to know the uh, nuances of that. So. Uh, very good morning, everyone, and I'm very happy to be here in Vizag, and thank you for the opportunity. Dr. Chintan, very nice to see you after a long time. Uh, I'm excited to be part of this session on corneal ectasia to present this very important case uh, that we have been following up for the last one and a half year. So uh, this is a 22-year-old male patient hailing from South India. He presented to me in 2016 with a history of having undergone cross-linking in another uh, institute in 2013 in the left eye and 2015 in the right eye. So uh, he uh, had uh, right eye haziness in the, I'm sorry, uh, can I get the pointer? The I'm not able to use the mouse on this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just can you give me a mouse, please? 
माउस ओनली माउस हाँ थैंक यू बस सो ही प्रेजेंटेड टू आस विद कंपेन्स ऑफ राइट आई परसिस्टेंट हेजीनेस इन विजन सिंस द प्रोसीजर एंड वी कुड नॉट कॉन्टैक्ट द सर्जन so to ask him whether it was an eventful or an uneventful uh, procedure and uh, but the institute where the surgery has been performed was uh, known to follow a strict dresden protocol for all cross linking cases so on examination his visual acuity was 6 by 36 in the right eye and it was improving to 6 by 6 parts with correction and he was reluctant for a contact lens trial because he said the very reason why i underwent um, uh, you know an extra procedure was because i didn't want to use any other glasses or contact lenses now he had this these persistent epithelial erosions along with it i don't have a fluorescein stain image but uh, and a very low shermer sto- score that is 8 mm at 5 5 minutes so in the uh, for this we prescribed topical pg ppg substitutes and over the le- next 3 months the erosions uh, actually resolved and after one year of observation and non resolution of that scar we performed a simple limbal, limbal epithelial transplant which we know reduces the scar density so we explained to him that the scar density would reduce over time and then uh, post procedure over the next 9 months as you can see the scar density has reduced and uh, he is now he was now 6 by 18 unaided um so uh, this this was the initial presentation as you can see even in the uh, anterior segment oct we can see that there is reduction in the uh, uh, in the uh, hyper in the reflectivity and also there was some increase in the pachymetry so post procedure the pachymetry actually increased and uh, you can see that there is no significant difference in the epithelial thickness map but the patient uh, 618 was obviously not still not happy and he continued to have experience blurring of vision for the distance now uh, he kept we uh, uh, amply uh, explained to him that there is nothing else that we can do right now and in january 2021 he presented with uh, again you know persistent complaints so in at this is it i just noticed that uh, there was some endothelial involvement of the scar area if you, as you can see in the uh, with the red uh, arrow mark and uh, specular microscopy showed poor cell density in the right eye that is 1702 as compared to the left eye which is 2370 so he was suggested to use uh, reposuril eye drops based on anecdotal anecdotal results from the japanese group and he used it on an off label off label basis with an adequate consent form for 4 months subsequently after 4 months of usage and 2 months of discontinuation of the rocket emitter the symptoms slightly worsened and then improved uh, very significantly and then the specular imaging uh, at the next visit also showed an improved count so here you can see that the counts have improved however if you see the hexagonality the coefficient of variation all parameters have not really improved that well but the patient was asymptomatic as compared uh, as a result uh, 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 with regards to his haze symptoms so this is the uh, summary of the case that is in 2013 and 15 the cr- cross linking was done uh, slet was done in uh, 2017 endothelial involvement was noted almost 6 uh, years after 7 uh, years 8 uh, years after the cross linking and then uh, on uh, reposidil the sli- count slightly improved and the symptoms improved so coming to uh, what might have caused it so we know that uv irradiation is known to be potentially cytotoxic and pro apoptotic in uh, mammalian cells so the initial works that were done by wolinsack have uh, d- in fact done uh, the animal studies for this purpose itself so what it does is it causes the formation of singlet oxygen it uh, uh, superoxide and hydrogen peroxide species in the endothelial cell not in the uh, upper, upper layers and this these consequently can result in apoptosis of the endothelial cells now uva has been reported to be cytotoxic in porcine keratocytes at the level of at a level of 4 milliwatts per centimeter square and but when it is con- combined with riboflavin it the ir- irradiation induces cell damage at an even lower level that is 0.35 milliwatts per centimeter square so this may this may be explained by the photosensitizing effect of riboflavin and uh, riboflavin when it is imbibed into the corneal stroma has been demonstrated to enhance the absorption coefficient therefore the uv light is sort of limited Uh, as, as long as you have a thickness of greater than 400 microns from the end, uh, the endothelium is shielded now insufficient installation of riboflavin or an incomplete removal of the uh, incomplete epithelial abrasion will limit the riboflavin imbibition and therefore it increases the uv irradiation so we have to understand that epithelium has to be off for better uh, absorption of the riboflavin especially in isotonic cases and uh, uv irradiation and irradiance and cytotoxicity at the endothelial level uh increases in such cases and to uh, avoid this cross linking inclusion criteria have been suggested and to be strictly followed as 400 microns minimum thickness 
uh, other things that can go wrong was, uh, are the calibration errors, incorrect focusing of light, which can happen because of patient movement, uh, tilt in the uh, in the head head level, or uh, a thin stroma with epithelial hypertrophy, which may mask the true thickness. Now, to avoid uh, the UV light overdosing, it is utmost importance to adhere to these safety parameters and uh, which vary according to the device that we are using. So it's best, especially now in the area where a lot of uh, companies are offering devices from one, um, uh, one hospital to the other, it's important to understand that every device has its own parameters and every device needs to be calibrated, especially if it's being moved from one place to another. Now, in order to endo minimize endothelial toxicity, uh, also the isotonic, uh, the hypotonic uh, use of hypotonic riboflavin was also suggested. And epithelial mapping is also very important in these cases, as we'll see. This is a slide that uh, Dr. Nikhil Gokhale has uh, uh, lent to me. And uh, these, this is one of the cases which very beautifully demonstrates how the epithelial hypertrophy can mask actual stromal thickness. So we are looking at a 400 micron stromal thickness and not the epithelial masked thickness. So before doing our C3R, the uh, message that this diagram is trying to tell us is that before doing a hypotonic C3R, based on the pentacam, you need to go back and look at the individual images uh, where the thinnest point is there and see what is the stromal thickness exactly. So if you go to all maps in your, uh, uh, to all maps in the, uh, to global pachymetry map, you will be able to see individual maps and then have a look at whether there is any epithelial masking happening or not. So uh, in keratoconus, uh, so in an, in an in-house study in Medivision Hospital, uh, so this data was kindly shared by Dr. Uh, Rupak Reddy from Medivision Hospital, uh, wherein they are, one of their DNB students actually followed up for, for the period of six months, uh, short-term changes in endothelial cell density after, uh, after doing collagen cross-linking. So uh, 35 patients specular microscopy was done at three time points. That is before the cross-linking, after the cross-linking at three months and at six months. And uh, interestingly, at 14.29% at three months showed a 200 to 400 density reduction and 22% almost showed at, uh, showed a 200 to 400 cell density reduction at six months. And 8% of the cases showed a uh, progressive cell loss. Uh, Ma'am, can I take just two minutes more? It's almost the last slide. Uh, so, uh, so far we found that in literature, uh, we, we, nobody has actually demonstrated, uh, actually described long-term endothelial cell loss and this is what we are doing. Uh, so what we feel as a conclusion is that LASIK extra or PRK extra procedures may have uh, pushed the limits of time-tested protocols. But uh, uh, extending indications of cross-linking to a normal cornea is not uh, free from uh, its... Uh, 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 risks and uh, I think there may be more cases that are coming up. We are currently following up another case, also similar case, uh, unfortunately done at the same hospital, but uh, she has also presented to us six years later. And uh, we started her on Riposuril and unfortunately there was no change absolutely in the cell count. Uh, however, she was having very similar symptoms to uh, uh, Fuchs dystrophy, wherein she was getting morning haziness, which has resolved after starting Riposuril. So thank you, Dr. Charuta. I think uh, what you've highlighted, the effect of the cross-linking on the endothelium is something, again, we need to look at carefully, whether it be in the uh, extra procedures where we are doing it as a refractive procedure or it be in keratoconus, especially in keratoconus where we have I the mean, I, uh, thinner corneas. What I think is it's at least justified for doing it in keratoconus. Yes. So subjecting a normal patient to the risk, another extra risk. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that uh, although I myself am personally not a fan of extra procedures, but there are uh, a lot of people doing it and we need to wait for long term literature, you know, true, to say true. completely that whether we can completely uh, put that aside and uh, debunk that or not. Mm -hmm. But uh, so what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, there's another school of thought these days that this that says that the endothelium is actually much more resistant to UV light than it was thought earlier, especially I'm talking about cross linking and people are going in for higher energies to, to do cross link, especially in trans-epithelial cross-linking. Yeah, so I mean, views on at that? this point of time, to uh, resort to human beings as an experimental model is actually not justified when we have so many animal models. No, no, that's so been done in animal models and then, you know, it's been sh shown to be safe in trans-epithelial at least. But definitely one has to be very careful and then looking at the endothelial uh, cell counts, that should be mandatory as a pre-operative workup for before you're doing any cross-linking and serial follow-ups. So, um, and also specular clinical examination, or specular reflection, so that you know you look at whether there are any pre-existing pre uh, endothelial uh, abnormalities is there. So if I may add to that point, actually, so previous, there was one case of, uh, there were two cases which were shared by Dr. Fogla, 
when he felt that the stroma was looking absolutely acellular. Uh, that is the crossing is actually killing the stromal keratocytes, whatever are left also, which is actually defeating the purpose. And in this uh, in this conference itself, Dr. Pankaj, if he's still here, has shared a few cases of CTK. Uh, that is uh, the toxic keratolite, wherein, wherein the uh, again similar probably uh, phenomena happening. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm I know you're talk asking about endothelial toxicity per se, but I, I'm I'm sure that you're not really no, of safe. Course, that's the mechanism how cross linking works, right? We all know that it does. In addition to cross-linking, it does cause keratocyte apoptosis, at least above the demarcation line. And it's ultimately later on that the keratocytes are repopulating the cornea. So that is to be expected in the initial phases. Up to uh, the death I mean, of he, the was extra, uh, he was sailing a couple of years after. I Sorry? mean, Dr. Fogla's case was seven years or eight years post. Yeah, so uh, and there's not been too many long-term studies on how quickly the keratocytes uh, repopulated. Yes, okay. And that's why, because apoptosis is a known mechanism, but I think endothelial toxicities. And the other thing, one thing I wanted to point out, sometimes this is, in the acute cases, once you're doing cross-linking, sometimes cross-linking can also lead to reactivation of HSV, and that can cause HSV endotheliitis. And that can be a cause of corneal edema sometimes, which we may think is due to excessive energy. So that, again, needs to be looked at. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to invite the next speaker, Dr. Rahul Bafna, for a management of a case of acute corneal high drops. So good morning, everyone. My talk for today is management of acute coronal high drops. So I'll start with a brief case summary. A 12-year-old boy presented to our emergency department with sudden onset of pain, photophobia, decreased visual equity, and vitis opacification in the left eye for the past three days. Parents gave history of rubbing of both the eyes for the past four years. On clinical examination, we can see an area of coronal edema of approximately 6 millimeter with multiple intrastromal fluid vacuoles, an ASOCT revealed a ruptured desmond membrane. Our diagnosis was both eye VKC with keratoconus with left eye acute coronal hydrops. We planned a left eye 14% C3 FA intracamel injection under general anesthesia and right eye cross-linking on a later date. We started patients on topical steroid, hypotonic saline, lubricating drops, cycloplegic and anti-glaucoma and antibiotics. On the day of surgery, isoexpansal concentration of C3F8 was used and the anterior chamber was filled up to two-thirds of the AC. The same medical treatment was continued in the post-op period. So this is a post-op day one image showing that the AC is filled with the two-thirds of gas. We can see there is some gas bubbles have been trapped in the stromal lamellae. It is because, because of the large desmid membrane tear. On post-op day 18, we can see there is a complete resolution of corneal edema with corneal scarring. So what is a corneal hydrops? It is nothing but a tear in desmond membrane which results in leakage of aqueous into the stroma and epithelium. Its incidence in keratoconus is around 3% and in PMD and keratoglobus is around 11%. The risk factors include are eye rubbing, young age, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, atopy, Down syndrome, mental retardation and trauma. In our case, the patient was young with a history of eye rubbing. So how does this acute hydrops develop? Because of vigorous eye rubbing, which is an inciting factor, results in tear in desmond membrane, which cause rolling of the edges and the gap is created. Aqueous then percolates into the corneal stroma, resulting in the separation of collagen lamellae. On later date, adjacent endothelium tries to grow over the defect so that they can prevent the seepage or and cause resolution of corneal edema. Normally, without treatment, resolution of corneal edema may occur between five to 36 weeks. Recently, Parker et al. has published that only desmond membrane rupture is not the root cause for coronal high drops. It is desmond membrane rupture along with the posterior st stromal lamellar disruption which causes the coronal high drops. So complications of coronal high drops are coronal scarring, coronal neovascularization, coronal perforation, coronal pseudocyst, infective keratitis, and coronal fistula. Whenever there is a deep corneal neovascularization, there is an increased chances of graft rejection on the f in the future keratoplasties. Treatment options are basically conservative and surgical. Conservative, as described earlier, coming to the surgical management, over the years, the treatment modality has changed. 20 years back, 25 years back, when we are managing conservatively, it took around two to four months for the corneal edema to resolve. 
there was increased scar formation, there was called new vascularization, perforation of keratitis. Now, with the new tec uh, techniques, we can actually manage them, we can cause, hasten the resolution of coronary edema within six weeks, even we can visually rehabilitate the patient within two weeks. Two, uh, two weeks. So surgical management strategies are basically four. In the first strategy, we either seal or approximate the desmond membrane tear, which results in prevention of further egress of aqueous into the stroma and hessian resolution. Or we can replace the torn desmond membrane with normal endothelium, but it is nothing but the replacing pathological desmond membrane, and we are maintaining the, then the endothelial integrity. The latest one is the replacing the edematostroma, by which we can re visually rehabilitate the patient and in patients with painful eyes or with no visual potential, we can do biological covers like amniotic membrane transplant or Gundersen flap. So let's see the first strategy. That is seal or approximate the desmond membrane tail. Miata et al. in 2002 has done the first surgical intervention acute corneal eye drops where he has injected just intracameral air. The resolution time was halved from, six, from mean 64.7 days to 20.1 days. But the problem was the patient's required number of injections, and the average number of injections were 2.4. Later, people th start thinking of using gases which can have longer duration of half-life. So uh, Panda et al. use SF6 gas, which is an intermediating long-acting gas, but uh, in this also, the resolution was within four weeks, but 66% of patients required repeat injection. Later, Cyan Basu et al. used long-acting C3F8. In this, the resolution time was halved, and none of the patients required repeat injection. Then people started thinking that how we can increase the resolution of corneal edema. So people came with full thickness sutures for corneal edema. So with this, the resolution time was four weeks, but there were complications like deep vascularization, sedal positiveness, and recurrence. Then people used mix and match. People started using MIOC guided drainage of acute coronal hydros along with gas suturing. With this, the resolution of edema came down to less than two weeks. Later, people uh, like Vajpetal use ASOCT for the management of acute coronal high drops. Here, they have localized the fluid vacuoles using ASOCT and just puncturing the fluid vacuoles and just injecting intracameral air. So no repeat injections were required in such cases. Now the patient, uh, now the surgical techniques are more evolved. Now there was a, this is a prospective randomized trial. The, com the compression sutures combined with intracameral air injection versus thermokeratoplasty for acute high drops. In both the groups, the resolution of coronary edema was within two weeks. So by now we know that combination of techniques resolute, uh, resolve the coronary edema as fast as less than two weeks. People then started thinking how to visually rehabilitate the patient as early as possible. So people have started doing thermokeratoplasty, that is cauterization of the corneal stroma. Then later, after two weeks, we, they perform early DALC. And by this method, the patient attained a visual equity of 20 by 16 or one year follow-up. Uh, the next strategy is the replacement of the desmond membrane. Only few case reports have been uh, reported. They have used DSEC, DMEC, or mini DMEC to actually uh, restore the integrity of the endothelial layer. So uh, we have not much data regarding this. Later, this is the recent one where we replace the edematostroma. We do DALC on the presentation, and patient gets the visual equity of 20 by 50 within two to three weeks. So take home message is very important. You should always identify the risk factors, counsel the patient regarding the same, about the follow-up. Combination of various te uh, techniques always helps to hasten the resolution of corneal edema, and newer modalities of treatment for early, for early visual rehabilitation of patients should be adopted as early as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahul. That was a very systematic and a very comprehensive review of the literature. Uh, so uh, may I ask the audience how many of us have treated cases of corneal hydrops? A show of hands, please. OK, so it's because, again, it is something which need not remain in the realm of a cornea, just a cornea specialist. It will come to the co comprehensive ophthalmologist. And uh, just a couple of tips, which the, because you mentioned, the, so the, like in the, your case, you showed just the uh, gas mm -hmm. injection. Gas but you've injection. shown so compression sutures plus gas injection works very well. It could depend on your stepwise approach. If the edema is not so much, maybe just a gas injection would suffice. On the other hand, if it is too much, compression sutures do work well. Uh, Preoperatively, before you take up the patient, before we take up the patient for surgery, I think a good dilated examination to see the direction of the tear in retroillumination. If one has access to an ASOCT, then a scan and seeing the direction is great. 
but even if one doesn't have that, dilate the pupil, try to do a retroillumination kind of a thing, and you would be able to see, is your tear directed this way or is it directed that way? And then your sutures need to be perpendicular to that. So dilate the patient, I mean, before you're taking up the patient for surgery one day prior, but on the day of surgery, do constrict the pupil, use pilocarpine beforehand so that you don't damage the lens because once one is passing the sutures, there is a high risk of damaging mm. the lens. The direction of the needle needs to be completely vertical, unlike what you do in normal suturing where it is a little tangential. And often injecting a little bit of air before passing the sutures helps to see the reflex of the needle well and suturing does that. And you mentioned about the SF6 and the C3F8. My personal preference now in all cases, even in DSEC and all, has shifted to using SF6. Air, I feel, sometimes tends mm. to disappear too early and C3F8 remains too long and it causes the risk of cataract. So SF6, I think, works very well and it is a good uh, borderline thing between, you know, to manage cases of conservative management with medication, I think, is very, very few cases. So I think we need to be aggressive about the treatment of high drops. But whether we need to be as aggressive in doing the dialects and all as quickly, that I would definitely have my reservations about. I think there's no harm in waiting a little bit while uh, doing this. So any uh, other comments from the audience regarding this? Thank you. So that was a good Thank talk. Thank you, everyone. And uh, now uh, I think we have Dr. Soumya Perry back with us. And she'll be speaking about to prevent and to protect is better than to repeat and repair. Early management and recent advances in keratoconus with CXM. Can we have a slides up on stage, please? So early management and recent advances in the management of keratoconus with CAXL. So we are all aware about the indications and that we know that uh, we need to take stage 2 and stage 3 classification of amsacumic for CAXL if possible. So patient education is important. It's necessary to tell them that it's not a refractive surgery. Early treatment is better for prevention and preventing rather than fixing the problems. And patients usually need spectacles or contact lenses even in the later stage. Few cases even may end up with corneal transplant. We are well aware about the Dresden's protocol. I'm not, going, I'm not going into that. So coming to the recent advances, uh, CXL protocols to improve oxygen diffusion. So accelerated cross-linking is based on the principle of bunsen rosa law of reciproca uh, reciprocity, which states that the same effect can be achieved by either applying a higher intensity for a shorter duration or a lower irradiation for a longer period, which avoids excessive stromal thinning and endothelial damage at a constant radiation exposure of 5.4 joules per centimeter square. But the demarcation line which is achieved with ACXL group is pretty shallow compared to that of CCXL group as seen in ASOCT. So in coming to transepithelial cross-linking, this allows corneas with advanced keratoconus to be treated. But the challenge is being riboflavin does not penetrate the intact epithelium. And intact epithelium also diminishes uh, the uh, diffusion of oxygen. And the demarcation line is also very shallow. So trans uh, epithelium cross-linking protocol with enhancers, like chemical enhancers, ion to phoresis, femtosecond laser assisted trans epithelium cross-linking has proven to, uh, proven to be beneficial. The advantages of TECXL being reduced risk of infection, less corneal haze, and fewer delays in epithelial healing. So ion to phoresis is a non-invasive technique where a small electric current is used to facilitate penetration of riboflavin, which is a negatively charged molecule, to increase the efficacy of TECXL. So studies comparing CCXL and ICXL in early stages have shown ICXL to be effective in halting progression and achieving stabilization as compared to that of CCXL. Also, the demarcation line which is achieved in ICXL is shallower and patients achieve better contrast sensitivity compared to that of CCXL group. So in pulse UVA irradiation, uh, with a predetermined on and off pattern, this enables better diffusion of oxygen into the stroma and the subsequent greater effect. So although pulse CXL shows promising results, as we can see in the studies, the exact duration of pulsing is debatable. 
So CXL protocols for thin corneas. Hypoosmolar cross-linking. Cornea is based on the principle that corneal stroma has a normal swelling pressure of 50 to 60 mmHg. So when it's exposed to a hypoosmolar solution, it can uh, swell up to double its thickness. So it's indicated in those corneas where the thinnest pachymetry is less than 400 microns post epithelial removal. So uh, with these, uh, uh, with the hypoosmolar cross-linking, there was reported stabilization in terms of mean K value and BCBA with no endothelial cell loss and stromal scarring. Hyperosmolar riboflavin uh, causes reduction of central corneal thickness and visual acuity observed in patients with pseudofacic bullous keratopathies. So contact lens assisted C, uh, CXL, CA, uh, CXL, where the indication being stromal thickness of 350 to 400 microns after epithelium removal. The mechanism being precorneal riboflavin layer, contact lens help in endothelial protection. The advantage being it's independent of the swelling properties of the cornea, but its limitations being riboflavin soaked CX, uh, C, uh, contact lens reduces oxygen availability and reduces the surface irradiation levels by 40 to 50 percent. So what is LASIK extra? LASIK improves the quality of vision, but it reduces the biomechanical strength of the cornea. So combining LASIK with CCXL enhances the biomechanical strengthening of the cornea along with improving the quality of the vision. So LASIK with concomitant half-fluence, high uh, irradiance cross-linking has been shown as a promising treatment modality with significant improvement in refractive stability and possibly reduced incidence of post-LASIK regressions. So CXL protocols for anti-infective applications, photoactivated chromophore for infectious keratitis. It's based on the mechanism that dis uh, disinfection of microbes by UV light and tissue stabilization can be achieved. And this helps in treating uh, corneal ulcers which are not responding to maximum topical medications. So in a study conducted in Arvindai Hospital, Madurai, they have shown that combining CCXL with fungal keratitis regimens and combining CCXL with bacterial keratitis regimens have uh, given promising results. So what are the CXL protocols for optimizing visual acuity? Customized cross-linking. In these studies, they have concluded that greater efficacy of smaller diameter cone-centric treatments for reduction of corneal curvature and higher order abrasions can be achieved. And the greater corneal surface normalization also leads to superior visual results. So TCAT procedure, topographic guided customized epithelial debridement of the keratoconic cornea sparing the epithelium over the apex of the cone. So the intact island of epithelium soaked with riboflavin causes UV attenuation and acts as a protective shield over the thinnest corneal point. The paracentral cornea where epithelium is removed allows better penetration of the riboflavin resulting in increased biomechanical stiffening effect as conducted by a study by Shetty Sir and all. So in Athens protocol, basically we are combining PRK with the combination of CCXL procedure to maximize the refractive normalization along with ectasia stabilization in young keratoconic patients so that it broadens the number of potential candidate cases that would have been limited to employ this technique due to tissue thickness limitation factors. So what is Cretan protocol? In this, we combine transepithelial PTK and CXF and this has found to be safe and effective in keratoconic patients over a long-term follow-up. So in ICRS with CXL, Kera ring intrastromal corneal ring segment insertion assisted by femtosecond laser performed si uh, simultaneously with corneal cross-linking. So this resulted in improvement of visual, refractive, and topographic outcomes. So what is AP of lenticule on CXL? It's a technique of tailored stromal expansion in corneas with pachymetries less than 400 microns where a stromal lenticule which was removed from patients undergoing smile for myopic corrections is used and the center of the lenticule is placed over the apex of the cone as seen on topography and conventional CXL is performed. So what is the future of CXL? What lies ahead for us? So basically it is to understand the relationship between riboflavin, oxygen and UVA. The newer accelerator protocols and combination treatments have opened up many options with far-reaching implications on the way we approach ectasia and refractive surgery. A greater degree of customization of treatments will enable us to achieve better refractive outcomes while maintaining a higher level of safety. Thank you. Hello. So recently, there is one more protocol uh, published about SEP. 400 protocol, M no more gram. So people are even trying for even thinner corneas like 100 
30 microns, 140 microns, they are just decreasing the time of irradiation time so that they can get a shallower demarcation line and there might be some better uh, thickening of it. Regarding this, I would like to ask ma'am so we have just, we've just recently started a study to see the effects of sub-200 protocol because we tried it in a few patients. I think once we do this, we it's kept, uh, important to know the different concentrations of the riboflavin solutions that we are using. You know, because uh, we've noticed as we've published this as well that once there's a difference between the way a dextran containing riboflavin works vis-a-vis -vis and HPMC containing riboflavin works vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, 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 I mean, uh, one which doesn't contain all of these. So because HPMC causes a better penetration but a much thicker effect, so it causes almost pre-desmetic demarcation lines. So while earlier it was believed that HPMC is good for thinner corneas because it doesn't desiccate the cornea, but once it's causing such deeper lines, that itself remains a cause for concern. So it's important to know which solution we are using. The sub-400 protocol they have mentioned has a solution which has neither, uh, neither dextran nor uh, HPMC. So we have to be careful about the uh, solution we are using. And there is also... Uh, a vitamin E containing the TPGS containing riboflavin which is now I think currently available it's somewhere down south only down uh, with Bangalore so we are planning to study that as well but it's important to know the solution you are using and then for how long to use it. It's not all procedures are not the same and you cannot uh, compare all procedures and a greater flattening doesn't always translate to a better outcome. Sometimes you see greater flattening and patients actually lose vision and uh, because you know you've altered the curvature too much, a lesser flattening sometimes leads to a better stabilization as well as a greater uh, improvement in uh, vision as well. So that's something I think we need to keep in mind. And then there are so many things for trans uh, thin corneas. All of them work, I think, uh, to an extent. It's just that we don't have long-term follow-up sign here of these. Thank you. Ma'am, can I make a comment? Yes, yes, please. So for the thinner corneas, actually, we also, uh, a lot of these patients who want something to be done, but when they, we can neither do corneal transplantation or actually requiring treatment. So uh, like you said, Ricrolin is not commercially available in India. So the sub-400 protocol. So we looked at another data from Mazota's group. So they have published M protocol, wherein uh, uh, they've uh, collected all the data or print published cases of uh, cross-linking that has been done in lesser than 400 micron thickness. And then they've uh, s retrospectively studied the demarcation line level and then given the advice on what is what could be followed how many minutes lesser or more so that we did in two cases and we've had good results the patients have been stable for the last three years now all of these i think basically essentially follow the same principle you are customizing either the energy or the time so that ultimately you are delivering the same uh, amount of uh, energy so that's why i said like i think all of them work to an extent and the role of oxygen there was a lot of hype about oxygen and now there's again uh, because i was recently at escs and dr farhad afezi who's you know just published this, he started with the oxygen and now he himself has started saying that probably the oxygen is not required uh, so much because it's not able to diffuse in, in the time that we are able to give. Again, we are doing a study there and we've seen that the demarcation line with oxygen is definitely deeper, but you do uh, get it otherwise as well. So I think um, there are too many nuances. Yeah, we're waiting for uh, out. from institutes whether yeah, yeah, regarding sub, sub 400. Uh, and I'd now like to invite the next speaker. Uh, uh, that's again a very important topic, cataract surgery in keratoconus. So do, do we have Dr. Mughandan Rajarajan? Yeah. Uh, so very good morning everyone. I'll be talking on cataract surgery in keratoconus patients. I have no financial disclosures. So before cataract surgery is considered, always ensure stability of the disease and assess corrected distance visual acuity using RGP contact lenses to eliminate the reduction in vision due to corneal component. So su surgical planning needs several unique considerations like proper pre-op planning, biometry, choice of IOL, what are intra-op surgical challenges due to poor vis uh, visualization during surgery and post-operative visual rehabilitation. 
So significant source of IOL error occurs due to uh, inaccurate measurement of the K reading. The conventional biometers, including IOL master and lens star, only estimate the total corneal power from the anterior curvature, and they assume a constant relationship between anterior and posterior corneal curvature. So challenges in keratoconus patient is like the posterior to anti segment curvature ratio is not maintained, and opt these optical biometers doesn't take into account the posterior corneal curvature, thereby overestimating the corneal power. And moreover, in keratoconus patient, the visual axis is not equal to the apex of the cornea. And due to steep K and deep anterior chamber, the effective lens position predictability also decreases. And other challenge be, uh, being altered ocular surface in case of keratoconus patients. So having known the limitations of this optical biometers, then where to choose the K values from? So in case of mild to moderate keratoconus, the K values can be taken from shimflex based uh, devices. In case of severe keratoconus where K value more than 55 diopter, it's better to use standard K that is 43.25. So this is a Galilee of a right eye keratoconus patient. Here the K value is taken from the mean total corneal power. Sim K is not considered as it uh, counts only 3 mm of the cornea. So the K value is taken from the mean total corneal power. And in case of pento uh, pentacam, we have something called equivalent K value reading which not only takes, in, takes into account, account the anterior posterior corneal curvature, but also refractive indices. So EKR uh, at 4.5 mm K values, at 4.5 mm zone, we can take the K values. So limitations being uh, Ashmi et al. found that in stage 1 to stage 3 keratoconus, pentacam at the highest repeatability of measurement in K values. Uh, Javel keratometer was next best to pentacam in documenting repeatability of the K values. However, poor repeatability of all these devices when K max is more than 55 diopters. So we can consider standard K. So now which IOL formula to use? Uh, K in et al. in their retrospective study of 147 eyes. In this table, we see various IOL formulas are ranked as per their mean absolute prediction error. And they found uh, K in keratoconus formula as, uh, was most accurate when compared to other formulas. Then SRKT was next most accurate when uh, uh, considering the traditional IOL formulas. So just a practical difference in biometry ensures stability of the keratoconus and measure K reading using a Schimpfleg or SSOCT devices, uh, which takes into account the posterior corneal curvature and incorporate the K readings in new formulas like uh, Barrett True K or Keynes formula or Holiday 2 formulas. Otherwise, use, uh, we can use SRKT formula. Use act actual K reading for mean K values less than 55 diopters. Otherwise, standard K of 43.25 is considered. Always ta target myopia of around 1 to 1.5 diopters. So now, which I will to use? The problems faced in keratoconus in advanced keratoconus patients have irregular astigmatism, which may not be coral, uh, which cannot be corrected with simple spirocylindrical lenses. So the keratoconus patients are more likely to suffer from higher order abrasions, since problems with multifocal and adopt lenses. And keratoconus patients may need corneal transplants in future. So always use monofocal lenses whenever possible. Better to choose myopic target. Use toric IOL when astigmatism is regular in the center and patient is unlikely to need corneal transplant. Avoid multifocal lenses. So what are the problems faced intraoperatively due to irregular astigmatism scarring? Visibility may be poor during surgery. And the surgical induced astigmatism may be unpredictable in already weak corneas and wounds may be leaky. So an RGP lens or viscoelastic may be used to improve visibility during the surgery. Here in this surgery, we can see there was a like there is poor visibility due to advanced keratoconus patient. So after placing a rigid gas permeable uh, lens, the visualization improved and the surgeon had better visualization. And use clearal tunnel whenever possible. Otherwise, place the main incision away from the cone. Uh, phaco emulsification settings to uh, control the anterior chamber depth by lowering the inflow pressure and allow for decreased intraocular pressure during the surgery. And suture the main wound at the end of the surgery. So the refractive surprises are common in keratoconus patient. And given the irregular astigmatism, toric IOLs may not be possible. And warn patients about refractive surprises. And there, is, there are always modalities to improve vision, like glasses, rigid gas permeable lenses, and uh, corneal ring segments. So just summarizing a treatment algorithm uh, in patients with keratoconus, first uh, we'll see whether it's, a, the, uh, it's stable or not. 
So in case of mild keratoconus patient with good distance correct, uh, good corrected distance visual acuity, when manifest axis is equal to the topographic axis, uh, we can consider toric IOL. When the manifest axis is not equal to the topographic axis, uh, cataract surgery with monofocal IOL. So in case of uh, moderate uh, keratoconus with poor corrected distance visual acuity, we can consider IC intracorneal ring segments followed by cataract surgery with monofocal IOL. So, uh, say, uh, showing few few, uh, few case example, a 64-year male who, is, uh, who has right eye keratoconus, his manifest ref refraction was minus 1.5 at 60, his best corrected visual acuity improving to 2050. Uh, for him, uh, we, uh, we took the K value from the mean, uh, from the Galili, uh, mean total corneal power was considered. You can see the difference between the K value in uh, from the, taken from the Schimpfler image as well as taken from the IOL master. For him, we, uh, Barrett's toric, uh, Barrett's uh, IOL formula was used and uh, 18 diopter I IOL was placed and patient was doing well with point for astigmatism post-surgery. So this uh, patient, 21-year uh, female, uh, who has both the advanced keratoconus with posterior subcapsular cataract. So for her, uh, FACO uh, with single piece monofocal IOL was planned uh, and the cane formula was used, superior clear corneal insertion was used and her best corrected visual acuity was 2080 with minus four sphere and minus three cylinder. Thank you. So it was very good presentation. <coughs> Generally, whenever we are dealing with the old patients, they already had an history of VKC during childhood. So always very important is to see how much amount of dry eye the patient has. Because the cornea itself doesn't, not only cornea provides abnormal aberration, but even the tear flame abnormality can lead to aberration profile. So always look for the dry eye. And till now we don't know which formula is best. So if you are lucky enough, patient might line to 66. In your case, you can see that the cone was little subcentral. These cases do good. Either you have a central cone, uniform cone, or you have a peripheral cone. If you have an irregular cone where you have a more astigmatism, these cases don't do that good. We are not able to absolutely promise results in, as in other cataract surgeries. But uh, the data with cane keratoconus formula is pretty robust. I mean, they've studied more than 800 cases. And uh, uh, another point I wanted to add was with the cane keratoconus formula, they've also recommended that uh, anything above 48 diopters, we need to aim for a myopic correction. So anything between 48 and 53, aim for minus 0.5. 53 to 58 is minus, minus one. Uh, 1. And then above that is 1.5 1 1 to 2.5. So that actually helps because many of these patients do land up in hyperopia. We do see that very commonly, very consistently hyperopic shift is uh, seen. So I think uh, we've used the cane formula in a couple of cases recently and we've got good immediate post-op results. But then again, uh, it's difficult to promise these patients uh, uh, predictability. So do we have Shilpa Tarini? Do we have Gadila Divya? So we don't have two speakers for this session, so we would like to conclude this session for now. Let's have a group photograph.